We'll have the roll call by the clerk. Chairman Coxall? Here. Councilor Amaro? Here. Councilor Creelman? Here. Councilor Jordan? Here. Councilor McLaughlin? Here. Councilor Pearson? And Councilor Reed? Here. I'll ask you all to join us in giving the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag. I pledge allegiance to the, to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. The next item will be the um, acceptance of the minutes from our last meeting. Are there any corrections or additions to the minutes from last month? If not, I'll take a motion that they be approved as presented. So moved. Second. All in favor? That's next item on the agenda, citizens discussion of items not on the agenda. Is there anyone who wishes to come forth to make a comment? If you please come up and give us your name and address at the microphone. Um, do I just give my, what I have to say later or now? No, you give us your name and if you want to discuss something that's not on our agenda, this is the time to do it. Oh. There's an item you want to discuss that is on the agenda? No. no. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> okay. So there, there's no one who wants to discuss an item that is not on the agenda this evening. Then we'll move on to reports and correspondence. Councilor Reid. Um, Madam Chairman, I would like to draw uh, to the attention of the public that I have submitted my letter of resignation to the Town Council, effective at noon on June uh, 10th. 1991. Any other reports or correspondence? Council McLaughlin. Madam Chairman, the Ordinance Committee does not have a meeting report because we got snowed out last week, but I want the public to be aware that we do have two upcoming meetings this month, one on Thursday, January 24th, where we hope to deal with the sign ordinance, the other on Wednesday, January 30th, where we hope to be dealing with the dead end roads. Thank you. No other reports and correspondence? They will move. Oh, excuse me, <coughs> Councilor Crailman. Madam Chairman, on December 14th, uh, 1990, the Cumberland uh, County uh, Commissioners uh, set the budget uh, for the upcoming year. Uh, the budget is $10,683,000, excuse me, $10,683,384. The share uh, or commitment that Cape Elizabeth uh, will make will be $351,709. This is a 3.26% commitment of the entire 100% uh, uh, county budget, noting that the overall increase is 5.71%. Thank you. Councilor Jordan. I just want to <coughs> add a little bit. Uh, the Cumberland County Jail Committee has uh, purchased the land. I mean, maybe I should say the county commissioners have purchased the land with for the site for the jail without going to court, and we got a pretty good deal on it. We ended up with a little more land than we anticipated, and we got it for a million dollars, just a little over a million dollars. Very good. Any other reports? Councilor Amaro. Uh, yes, I just would like to report that the Appointments Committee has scheduled three evening uh, meetings in which we will be interviewing all uh, citizens who have shown an interest in serving on a uh, board or committee. And those meetings have been scheduled uh, in January. And people who have uh, filled out an application and said that they are interested will be hearing from us as to when their interview has been scheduled. Thank you. There being no further reports and correspondence, we'll go on to the next item, which is a public hearing on the school budget outlook. It also would, um, is open to discussion of the municipal side as well. And we'll have Councilor Creelman, who's chairman of the Finance Committee, give the background information. 
Thank you, Madam Chairman. <coughs> As we began last month at our monthly town council meeting, uh, after our town manager <coughs> gave a summary of the revenues to date and the projected revenues for fiscal year 1992 with regard to the budget impact schedule, we had an opportunity uh, to look at two issues with respect to the uh, current budget process that has begun for fiscal year 1992. We considered uh, as a group whether or not at the beginning of the budget process we would determine a specific amount of the tax uh, necessary to support both the municipal and school services uh, in the town of Cape Elizabeth for 1992. And if we were able to establish uh, that figure, uh, what should that figure be? We had an opportunity for public input. There were five uh, citizens who came forward, um, Nicholas Young, Michael Davis, Dean Stearns, Frank Potenzo, and Herb Dennison, who gave their views on uh, the current uh, budget circumstances. We had uh, pretty much confined our input during the December meeting to the municipal side, and tonight is an extension to uh, receive further input from uh, citizens with respect to uh, not only the municipal side, but uh, also the school side for fiscal year 1992. So what I would like to request uh, is do we have anyone here present this evening who has input with respect to the municipal side first, and then uh, I will ask for a brief presentation by the chairman of the school board, Mr. Leslie, with respect to where some numbers are anyway, at least on the school side at the moment, and we can have a follow-up uh, with respect to input on the school side. So I'll first ask if there are uh, anyone present this evening who would like to give their views with respect to the municipal side. Going once. <laughs> Quiet citizenry. All right. Uh, I might ask then, Chairman Leslie, uh, if you might be able to provide us with an update with respect to at least some of the numbers that uh, I know you've worked very, very hard over the last six months to uh, come up with, uh, given the circumstances of the school budget. Thank you. Good evening. Let me say first, for the benefit of uh, my fellow board members, uh, that uh, I'm a little bit surprised to be here uh, tonight, but uh, very pleased to have the opportunity. Last night, uh, Councillor Creelman called me up and asked me for a preview of my comments. And after a pause, I said, on what? And uh, apparently, we had had a miscommunication somewhere along the line. So uh, it was very fortunate that you did call. But none of the other school board members know that I am here tonight uh, uh, making these comments. But these comments will essentially be a repeat of the comments that I made at the December board meeting, uh, for those of you who uh, didn't hear that, uh, I know that all of the counselors have uh, in their packet uh, essentially the same material that I presented that evening in December. So what I'd like to do is just go over it very quickly and, for the, and uh, please feel free to interrupt me at any time if you have a question. Uh, the summary of the the budget uh, that you have in front of you is essentially the product of the computer model that we uh, have been constructing in the last few months. This is an enormously complex and complete program which allows us to track the ramifications of all the decisions that we will be making in the future. And let me stress that we have made no decisions. Uh, this model uh, has merely prepared the ground for us to 
make decisions and analyze the effect of those decisions when we are actually faced with them. The timeline for preparing the budget, incidentally, is that the administrators are at present working with their budget, building by building, department by department, and they will be working with the superintendent in the next few weeks, and it's our hope that the superintendent will present to the board a budget in February. That's probably a month earlier than usual, but in view of the problem that uh, almost every government uh, faces uh, in this country, uh, it's better that we start early. Now, what do these numbers uh, show us? First of all, we have to discuss the assumptions that lie behind these numbers. First of all, there is no assumption for an increase in any staff salaries. So those numbers are uh, zero with, the, with two exceptions, which you probably some of you have already noted, and I'll come back to those. Another assumption that we make is that fringe benefits, principally health insurance, only go up 10%. That's probably a very optimistic uh, scenario. We all know that health care costs have been going up uh, in excess of 20 percent for some years now. There is no increase in supplies. And since uh, I think we can expect a 5 percent or so inflation rate, that means that we're really, in these numbers, showing a 5 percent reduction in real dollars. We predict that all other costs go up 5 percent. One of those costs, uh, of course, will be fuel. And as we gather here this evening on the brink of what is a very complicated and dramatic set of circumstances in the Middle East, there's no way of projecting what the price of oil will be tomorrow, next week, or next year. Uh, so that's another major variable. Another assumption we make is that state aid remains level. Again. I think that's about the best that we can hope for. I know the commissioner uh, has uh, proposed that state uh, funding remain level in fiscal years 92 and 93, the next biennium. Uh, that doesn't mean necessarily that Cape Elizabeth will get precisely the same amount that it's gotten in previous years, because that will depend on our valuation and, and uh, the possibility, of course, that the state government may decide to route money to communities that are more needy than ourselves. Now, under these assumptions that I just described, the school component of the local real estate tax would have to go up, bear with me, 10.4 percent. Now, why is that? Well, as you know, we have in the last couple of years spent down the cash balances that have been carried forward, and uh, they promise to be quite small at the end of this year. I understand that municipal government faces essentially the same problem. Uh, in any event, uh, doing that and hoping for better times turned out to be far too optimistic. This brings me finally to uh, the the second page, I think it's called page one there, and I draw your attention to index and career ladder uh, salaries, and you'll see that the increase there is 5.3 percent. I told you earlier that uh, this model projects that there will be no increase in teacher remuneration in this model, and this is purely for presentation. Uh, I gave, uh, at the request of the Cape Elizabeth Education Association, uh, a printout which showed the effect of uh, a 3 percent increase and, uh, secondly, a 6 percent increase. The 3 percent increase, incidentally, resulted in the increase in the local real estate tax of, I think, 14 percent, as I recall. Uh, so the reason that you have a 5 percent to 5.3 percent increase in this projection is that 16 teachers move on to the career ladder this year. And by estimating, and we can only estimate, uh, or maybe guesstimate is a better word, uh, at what, which levels they will be placed, we can 
make an assumption as to how much money they will be earning. In addition, a number of teachers, probably around six, will move on to the, uh, sorry, will probably move within the career ladder. So that increase of 5.3%, uh, a little over $200,000, uh, in this projection would go to uh, 22 teachers approximately. Uh, this is perfectly normal. This is what we bargained for. This is uh, uh, no different than what's gone on in previous years. It's uh, perhaps slightly more concentrated and dramatic, uh, but uh, it does highlight the cost of the, uh, the career ladder, and that's a subject that we've been wrestling with all year long, and we will continue to wrestle with it. Uh, but that's the explanation of how that works. So what you're looking at is uh, with, and this is totally hypothetical, negotiations with the uh, Teachers Association has, have not started. Uh, they start, I think, uh, week after next. Uh, that'll be the very first meeting. Uh, and it's hard to predict at this time where that will come out. But finally, and then after that, I'll stop and let you ask me some questions. <coughs> let me point out to uh, everybody a point that is, is very important, and that is that 83% of our spending is for staff remuneration. So that if we have to cut, let's say, $700,000 out of our, our budget to achieve, for example, a 5% increase in the local real estate tax, at least 83% of that is going to have to come from staff, and staff is program and vice versa. They're the same thing. So that is what uh, we are wrestling with. Uh, this, uh, these numbers are, have been used so far to <coughs> illustrate the nature of the problem. It can be solved in, in a number of different ways from uh, uh, concentrating uh, all the economies that we must achieve uh, by cutting program, and uh, or it can be achieved by a combination of cutting program and accepting a, uh, a higher real estate tax than we would otherwise want to. So at that point, let me, uh, let me stop and see if uh, counselors have any questions. And I'd be willing <coughs> to take questions from the floor if that's appropriate, Wayne. Surely. Uh, I might uh, invite first <coughs> perhaps uh, any questions from the floor while uh, Chairman Leslie remains at the podium, and then I can follow that up with uh, questions or comments from the council. Are there any particular uh, clarifications um, for Mr. Leslie, <coughs> given his outline at least of uh, what would be an extremely austere uh, approach to the school budget this year? Um, in the ballpark of a 10.4% uh, a increase, um, given uh, relatively conservative estimates on both the health insurance and the other costs uh, uh, being capped at 5%. <coughs> All right, uh, please, uh, Mr. Thompson. Uh, We'd like to, to hear you if you could perhaps move down to the podium and ask your question there and maybe just then yield a foot or two so Peter can respond. I have some comments that I want to make later, but I did have a couple questions. I don't understand uh, how the assumptions that were made call for a 10.4% increase. A little tr difficulty tr following the math when I don't see where any particular item is going to be increased by 10.4 percent. Um, the uh, I, w I was wondering if if any. I mean, I think we've got some pretty good ideas as to what the actual costs are going to be, and if actual costs were utilized in any of your programming assumptions. I mean, you have actual costs for many of your different budget items. Was any budget scenario run on actual costs as they're going to be? 
Well, this is based on uh, these numbers. You haven't seen these numbers, have you? So no. you haven't had a chance to study them. There's, there's no reason why they can't be made uh, you know, public, as far as I'm concerned. Uh, they are, certainly, there are enough copies floating around. But uh, this is based on the actual costs of staff this year. So it is the answer to your question with regards to 83% is that, yes, it is based on uh, our actual costs. And as a matter of fact, we had, uh, when we went into this very detailed analysis, we found that uh, there probably was uh, conceivably $100,000 that had been budgeted for last year. Uh, as you recall, uh, the typical way of budgeting is a price per teacher, or an average cost per teacher. And because uh, you can't get that right, you're making a budget in March and you're hiring people in August and September, you don't know who you're going to be hiring for sure. So uh, what we did here in order to achieve exactly the type of precision that I think you'd like us to have is we use actual costs. Uh, we did not do that for you know, every category, uh, but the rest of them are de minimis. Uh, they're just not that, <coughs> that important. So uh, yes. and. Uh, other question, in your 10.4 assumption, uh, was there any, in that 10.4 assumption, is there any program that is, has already been determined to be taken out of your budget? No, uh, if I didn't say that, I meant to. Uh, this uh, budget, and this, the, this really isn't a budget, this is really just numbers based on last year's budget. Uh, what we're doing this year, and there's no reduction of any position at all. I know that there are rumors floating around because they come back to me, but uh, there, is, there is no reduction whatsoever. Every, it's the assumption is that every existing program and employee goes forward unchanged. Now, let me go back again to, it, it is hard to understand uh, why you have a 10.4 increase with the assumptions that I gave. But remember, the cash is gone. That's been spent down in the last couple of years. It's virtually gone. You never know for sure because, you know, the year's not over, but it's certainly going to be much less. And so that has been going to support existing programs. Now, secondly, the state aid is going to maintain, be level at best, so that the entire burden for whatever increases there are is going to fall on the local tax rate. You certainly clarified that. Uh, are there other questions in the uh, <coughs> audience this evening? Well, perhaps, uh, Peter, do any of the counselors have uh, questions at this point? Please. Well, what are the plans for looking at programs? I mean, you're assuming in these figures everything stays the same. Well, the, the normal budget process will be followed. Uh, it's going on right now. The administrators, uh, they're aware of this information. Uh, they are uh, processing it. Uh, I've met with them. The superintendent has met with them. Uh, so uh, every administrator is, is aware uh, of the nature of this fiscal problem. And indeed, I think it's very hard for anybody not to be aware of the federal, state, and municipal problems. And so. Uh, it's certainly my belief that they're taking this uh, very seriously and they're looking, therefore, at uh, you know, what uh, core programs we must maintain. Uh, they're looking at what uh, programs we'd like to have. And they're probably making uh, very hard choices right now. But the school board is not involved in those yet. The process will be at the February meeting. The superintendent will present to us a formal budget proposal and uh, we will look at it. And uh, I suspect that uh, there will be some uh, changes in program in that uh, budget. It's hard to imagine how that could be avoided. So then when we have that, we will then set up a schedule for uh, public hearings. And uh, I'm sure there will be even more input from the public than there was last year. Peter, could I just have a, a clarification 
and uh, again, I want to underscore the fact that uh, it is not our desire, our responsibility, our duty to uh, to ask or tell the school board to do anything. I uh, just want to repeat that at the beginning of the process. Yet obviously the, the variables that you have to work with um, are <coughs> programs, uh, our class size, and our teachers pay, uh, those three major areas. Just with respect <coughs> to the issue of teachers pay, because that's certainly the lion's share of the budget, am I correct in assuming that during this budget process there will be 16 teachers who will be moving on to the career ladder and six teachers already on the career ladder will be probably moving up a step or two is that a, a rough a step would be I believe the maximum move but uh, yeah that is correct however uh, the numbers could be somewhat different because the school board does not participate in the evaluations. Uh, it doesn't participate in those decisions mm -hmm. at all. Mm -hmm. So that uh, we have asked our staff people to give us an estimate mm -hmm. of what might happen. But if that was true, I mean, if yeah. that did happen, let's just say hypothetically, uh, where you have the salary projections just for movement on the career ladder assuming there was no pay increase at all for index teachers there's a figure of six point nine million dollars is there any variable to the career ladder at this particular time i mean in terms of the negotiations that will be going on uh, with the cape elizabeth <coughs> uh, educational association from the point of view of the specific steps, the, the, the five steps on the ladder, is there any uh, opportunity, possibility of somewhat narrowing those steps, or is that already something that has been promised to? No, that's a subject uh, for negotiation, and uh, I can give you the exact date if I look at my calendar. I, uh, together with uh, John Holt, will be meeting with the the Cape Elizabeth Education Association on January 23rd, uh, they will present to us uh, a proposal. I, of course, have no idea what that proposal will be, and uh, therefore even less of an idea of what, what the board might uh, decide to counter. But uh, it, it certainly uh, is a subject for negotiation. Thank you, uh, Peter. Are there other uh, please. Thank you. Uh, Chairman Leslie, in going over these um, projections, I was just wondering if you could help me with a few other things. Did you project an increase in or decrease in enrollment? No. Level. Level enrollment. Level enrollment. Uh, and uh, that's a, uh, a leap of faith. Okay. Maybe we'll have less than 141 new kindergartners. Um, also, I'd like to know, is there any assumption for any surplus whatsoever? Or are you assuming zero? Well, there is a, uh, a possibility of a surplus. Uh, it, it has been my uh, desire for a long time to move away from the concept of a surplus. Uh, I think that it's a bad habit in uh, preparing budgets and what I would prefer to see would be a contingency fee, let's say a fund of $100,000, which could be invaded only under certain circumstances. For example, a superintendent might be able to, uh, to meet an emergency of some sort, uh, decide to spend $1,000 per event. Uh, and after that, it might have to go uh, to a higher level, the chairman of the school board's finance committee, or the finance committee, or the entire board. And that would eliminate what you know we've had here for many years which is a kind of rolling several hundred thousand dollar fund uh, so what what we've done is we've taken the the money from the uh, from looking at our actual employment uh, which is what you have in front of you and what was budgeted and put that down in the miscellaneous column uh, 
and we're still reconciling that amount, incidentally. So uh, uh, that's the 111,000, and that is, uh, in my mind anyway, the uh, uh, the number that we might start thinking about as a contingency fund and establish some very strict parameters so that it can't just be kind of used for anything. Thank you. Um, have you made any calculations based on conservation of energy and fuel usage um, based on the $78,000 energy conservation devices that were installed? Well, they're in there, uh, not very uh, precisely. The, uh, the business manager, uh, as I can't remember if you were at the last school board meeting, he uh, <coughs> showed us a small spreadsheet that he's working on and uh, we're working on a, uh, a way to monitor that very closely, monitor our savings, rebates from CMP, and uh, that sort of thing. So, uh, but that's not, that's not in place yet. The assumption is essentially a, an assumption that uh, our costs will continue at the 5%, they will increase at 5%. I think that's probably too optimistic in view of what's going on right now in the Middle East, but when we did this, it was in January, uh, December. But is it realistic to assume a 16 to a 25 percent reduction in consumption, regardless of price? I'm would sorry? Would it be realistic to consider a 16 to 25 percent reduction in consumption, regardless of cost, based on that $78,000 worth of energy uh, uh, and, uh, conservation the, devices? The equipment that we're putting yes. in to save it? I mean, is it... I mean, a, a savings in BTUs? Yes. Right. Uh, I think that's a uh, minimum number, but okay. uh, I must say I have not committed that one to memory. No, and, and I just, I'm just trying to get a feel for that and um, looking at those numbers. Um, the other and the last point that I would like to make is, um, do you have any comments as to what the unionization of the administrators will do to the um, administrators 7.3 uh, and 7.1% of budget? I don't have any uh, editorial comment on that. It's their right to organize, and if they hold a vote, and uh, you know, then I think we recognize them, and and that's it. Okay. Thank you. I just want to add a couple of things. Council Creamy did uh, clear a lot of that, but I was going to touch on, as I said. Two years of Quill had us going to bankrupt the town and rearrange somehow the own line because as I built that out, to me it's a sizable increase for the cost of teacher and the family. And uh, I don't know just how to hit upon it. Uh, to me, that, uh, you're looking for some ideas that maybe that you were going back and look at. Is that what we're here for? You, this is put together as status quo uh, and with no idea of making any changes at this time. Okay. Is that correct? No, no, that's not correct. Uh, it, I speak only as a, a single board member on an issue uh, of this uh, magnitude and importance. Uh, as I said earlier, there was an effort this year, and I think, uh, how many meetings were held? Eleven? Of the Career Ladder Committee? But no conclusion was reached. Now, there's no doubt whatsoever, and I'm sure all of you have seen the, uh, the report that was prepared by uh, Michael Higgins, who was uh, an intern uh, working under the supervision of uh, the town manager, or at least with the town manager's money. Uh, and, uh, and thank you for paying for this. I, I think uh, the town <laughs> did. Uh, but what it shows is, uh, if I can find uh, the page, do you, do you all familiar with the document which I'm speaking? There's a graph somewhere which shows a notional cost of the career ladder to the town. And uh, speaking from memory, this year it's uh, about $500,000, and uh, I'm sure it's in here. And it goes up at uh, maybe $100,000 a year for the next few years until it... Uh, is fully implemented and everybody who can get on it is on it. And here's the, the last page. 
$500,000, and this, these are notional numbers. These depend on some assumptions that uh, are somewhat heroic. Uh, but uh, next year would be $700,000, and uh, the year after that, uh, same $700,000. Uh, it's obviously a big number. I mean, I think we all know that, and we can sense that. Uh, and I think we have to, uh, my own personal view is that we have to do something about it. But as I stand here tonight, I'm not quite sure what. Well, whatever number you throw out tonight is going to be the one that's bound me around. But you're going to put 400 or 300 or 600. 500 is the one that's going to move people's mind. That is what is going to increase. And the other thing that I was wondering, will you be looking at class sizes? So you could cut back on some staff? I think we probably have to look very uh, carefully at class size. It's, uh, it's wonderful to have small classes, but we may not uh, be able to afford it. And just one other point, I enjoy these youngsters here that fills half of the hall. I believe they're more really interested in what's going to happen to school, or either they're here by Somebody has told them they should be here. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll show you that I have one copy of your schools that continue to be open so that we can build that school. <laughs> Further comments, uh, Madam Chair? I wanted to ask um, Chairman Leslie if you were completely committed to this um, large increase in the career ladder for this next year, given with our, our top economy and um, decreased revenues. Are you completely locked into this additional $200,000? Can that be renegotiated? That's a very difficult uh, question for me to answer, uh, partly because it has something to do with next year's negotiations. And uh, I wouldn't want to say or do anything that might be deemed unfair labor relations uh, practices. I'm not saying that anything I might say might be that, but uh, it's my understanding that uh, the entire subject, as I said earlier, is a subject for negotiations. Now, if I can stand aside for a minute uh, and just, uh, you know, as a practical matter, you know, highlight the obvious difficulty of having <coughs> embarked on a path five or six years ago with the career ladder to suddenly suspend it would uh, seem terribly unfair, I think, to uh, most of us, to the people who would be directly affected. Well, after having your, one of the um, big comments that kept coming up last year was the fact that the career ladder was what was causing so many problems with our budget, and that you were going to have meetings and try to determine a solution to the problem, or and you have had your 11 meetings, but you really haven't come to any conclusions at all? Yeah, I guess, although I did not belong to that committee, uh, and uh, perhaps uh, at this stage I ought to ask uh, the superintendent who went to the last few meetings to uh, make some comments about that, because uh, I guess I'm copping out on that one, <laughs> and uh, I'd like to pass the buck. <laughs> Well, uh, again, I have to say that I'm coming into a situation that was started a number of years ago and is clearly one of the most difficult I've ever seen, and I've been in this business for almost 30 years. It's difficult because people have given a great deal of very earnest effort to a very sincere and broad-based um, educational reform package. It is not, a, it's not simply a uh, matter of pay scale that's at issue here. There are a number of interconnected issues. What I did observe in the meetings that I uh, attended, it was clear that there had been uh, a number of issues surfaced in the budget. There was um, an attempt to put together a committee that might be able to come up with some solutions, but feelings are running extremely high. This is a um, an experimental program uh, that uh, has never gone through a year, I'm told, without having some revisions. Um, this is an unusual combination of wanting to keep the best that is in the program while facing up the necessity of the budgetary issues that you're raising. 
Um, I do believe myself, again, stepping aside, and I think uh, uh, Chairman Leslie is absolutely accurate. We are dealing with a, a number of tricky issues. Negotiations are uh, intimately involved in this because the career ladder was adopted by the school committee. Uh, it has been part of your budget. It is part of the contract. It is part of the adoption by the Teachers Association, and the Teachers Association is not united on this issue either. Therefore, we have numbers of um, very delicate balance issues, how to keep the best of the reform movement, and there's been uh, a number of uh, obvious accountability issues, how to look at the pay issues, and how to c come through this process without uh, tearing the system apart. It is a difficult issue. I think that it is a time when we need to um, look at calm and reasoned debate. Uh, as we put the budget together, uh, we have not only the career ladder for teachers to be concerned about as an aspect for teacher pay, the index uh, issues, but don't forget we have a number of other employees too, and frankly, uh, the board is going into negotiations with everybody. So we are putting a budget together with a lot of assumptions. Um, I think that uh, I see a lot of very well-intentioned people, a lot of people who have given a lot of effort to this issue. Um, I'm sure that we can come up with some solutions, but because uh, all the, the money threads go right back to a contract that must be negotiated, it is not possible for a committee, aside from the negotiation process, to come up with a clear uh, and uh, absolutely definitive package. And that was really, we got to some various scenarios, but we weren't able to come up with that clear definitive package because it does, in fact, have to be negotiated. It's a kind of non-answer, but it's the best I can I can give you at the moment. Any other question? On this? I, I have I have one question that I meant to bring up. Will you have you Will you be all wrapped up as far as salary go by the time this budget is is approved? We probably won't have any salary. So you'll have to estimate what that's you correct. Add into the budget. I thought that was brought up last year. I know you guys brought it up that you was going to try to have that wrapped up so when your budget was put together, you would have a definite figure of increase in what the salary So now, you, on any farther ahead than you were a year ago, you're going to come up with an estimated increase. Is that correct? Uh, when you, you say last year, you're referring to two years ago when we negotiated the major contract with the Teachers Association? That's correct. Yeah, we, uh, as you recall, uh, maybe I shouldn't say that because I'm not sure I recall it, uh, we had a difficult arbitration uh, case which was settled and then we commenced negotiations and we certainly went home with a contract signed before June 30th, before the year ended. However, I believe that we did the budget before the, the two-year contract was approved. And so the budget uh, had an estimate for what we thought based on the negotiations up to that point uh, but uh, that was uh, still a guesstimate. I'm all set. Please, Jane. Uh, I think we're really fortunate that we're going into the budget year without a contract already in hand, personally, uh, because if you look at what's happening at the state and everywhere else, uh, contracts are probably not going to be able to be met and, uh, by lots of people. I hope that uh, the department, the, the uh, school department is going into, uh, or the school board is going into negotiations with their own proposal and not uh, going to be just reacting to whatever the association proposes because I think it's, this year in particular, it's really important to go in with uh, knowing what it is that you want to come out with. And, uh, well, I, so, I, you know, I hope that you've got a, a proposal prepared that, well, that I you're going to offer at the table also. I, I guess I don't think that it makes uh, a lot of difference who goes first uh, because I think what's going to determine this as far as we're concerned is the reality of the financial situation and I think that's going to be uh, the driving force in these negotiations. And uh, I wouldn't, uh, I, I guess I would prefer not to put the first uh, offer on the table. but. That's certainly a subject on which reasonable people could disagree. Does, uh, 
Do, do you have a professional negotiator or not? Um, well, maybe maybe the time should be <laughs> that term should be uh, defined. Uh, uh, you know, we have counsel. Okay. Uh, John Horton, <laughs> John Holt, sorry, John Holt and I are on the negotiating team. Uh, both of us have had a fair amount of experience with this. Uh, in my case, more than 30 years. Uh, I'm not sure you ever become a professional. You might bill yourself as one, but this promises to be a very different and difficult series of negotiations. But let me ask you what you had in mind when you asked the question, because maybe uh, we should have somebody uh, who... Uh, well, I, I just want to make sure that the town is being represented as uh, professionally as is the Teachers Association, because certainly they always have professional uh, staff working with them. Well, we they don't actually. Sure they uh, two years ago, and of course, I, I'm not <laughs> sure that we want to look back at two years ago because uh, those were very rosy times, and uh, we all thought they probably would go on for a lot longer. And uh, so uh, they didn't. And uh, in retrospect, uh, we probably uh, had a pretty generous settlement uh, in terms of what happened, but uh, it was certainly less generous than uh, the, uh, the contract that the state signed with its own employees. In any event, looking backwards doesn't get you anywhere. In those negotiations, there were no professionals on either side. If anything, the, uh, on a regular basis, if anything, we had our counsel there uh, from uh, Nick Nadzo more often than, uh, far more often than they had, uh, than the association had uh, uh, somebody from the, uh, the association in uh, Augusta. But uh, if anybody has strong feelings or strong ideas on that subject, I'd certainly like to hear about them. Because we're about to start. Let me uh, <coughs> ask, are there any other Comments or questions, uh, Councilor Reed? Yes, I just have a final uh, question, and that is, is this a zero-based budget proposal? No. This is not. Uh, this is a projection based on our actual, largely on our actual experience this year. The zero-based budgeting, I hope, is going on right now with the uh, with the administrators, looking at every every expenditure and every program. De novo, again, new, and uh, deciding uh, and thinking about its uh, particular merits. So but this is not. This is not definitely. Not. We would view this basically as a ballpark to look at, and that the zero base that we discussed in the uh, joint meeting with the town council school board um, might present savings of six hundred thousand dollars. That last year was budgeted for maybe yes it certainly might absolutely without yeah. any cuts in yeah. programs Th this is oh no <coughs> I doubt that but uh, this is an attempt to define the problem the magnitude of the problem and the problem being uh, if we continue everything the way it is and make some reasonable assumptions about inflation and other costs and uh, uh, increases or lack thereof of uh, staff remuneration then what's our local real estate tax going to be going to be 10 percent? Is it going to be 14 percent? That's what this program does. If you tell us that 14 and a half percent is fine, uh, we'll, uh, do I hear anybody nodding? <laughs> anybody <laughs> nodding? There's silence, Mr. Leslie. Uh, <coughs> perhaps I best not follow that <laughs> train of thought. <laughs> yes. Uh, I just want to say that you know, even with your projections here, even mentioning 10.4 percent just based on the career ladder, increases um, is very distressing because we asked our town manager to sort of dream of a budget with maybe a 5% increase and perhaps that would even be cut. So well, that's sort of the guidelines we gave yeah, our let town me manager. Let me reiterate that this, uh, it's as I mentioned several times last night to, to uh, Wayne, this is not a proposal. Yes, I this is an analytical that. tool. I'm just letting you know how I'm reacting to that percentage. Okay. Any other comments? Uh, oh, please, Jenny. Thank you. I think a lot of the issues that 
are strong and forefront in my mind been brought up tonight, Peter. The career ladder certainly is always a financial concern. I do want to say that I find your assumptions to be probably, I would classify them as overly optimistic, and I hope you will go into your negotiations with the Teachers Association with that in mind on the town side, on the yeah. school board side. Yeah, I certainly agree with you, and I think I, in my initial comments, I characterized almost one of, every one of those assumptions as pretty optimistic. And certainly since December 15th or so when I prepared these, there's nothing in the economy of the world or the United States of America that would uh, have justified any optimism. Uh, things are really significantly worse uh, on the economic front uh, than they were 30, 40 days ago. So I couldn't agree with you more. Good point. I think perhaps if you were initially preparing this right now, some of your assumptions may have been adjusted downward financially. And I just think we need to keep hammering away at people so it's not going to be a big surprise when we're going through the finalization of the budgets that it's going to be a very tough year. And don't be surprised if we have to make some very painful decisions. No, I, I couldn't agree with you more. And uh, as I've said on several occasions, now that this model is up and running, uh, people who have views and ideas can uh, contact me or uh, uh, Dee LaBelle and uh, ask, what would it look like if such and such and such and such? And uh, we should be able to tell you rather quickly. So. Well, I'd like to thank uh, both yourself, Peter, as well as our superintendent for the input that uh, we received this evening. Uh, Madam Chair, I will yield to your closing the public hearing and make a few comments. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Leslie. The public hearing is closed and we certainly... Yes? Are you sure that there are other people that wanted to... I didn't see any other hands. Uh, there are hands. All right. oh, Please come I forward. apologize. I thought we were we had uh, ended the citizen uh, input. Please. Good evening. I'm Rachel Walls, and I'm a middle school student who lives at 197 Ocean House Road. And I would like to uh, um, respectfully request um, that the town councilors overlook the fact that. Um, the school board has used s most of their money or some of their money um, on roofs that had to be taken down, construction that had to be torn down, and paying for two superintendents. And I would like um, to ask you, um, town councilors, to please overlook that so that we can concentrate on spending our money on things that the students really want, which are programs ranging from math or English um, or industrial arts or life skills. Um, last year, the students and the parents tried really hard to raise money to help um, in the budget process with some of the money problems, and they failed. And so we're asking you to please um, very carefully look at this because you and the school board are the only two committees that can make these kind of decisions that affect us directly. And we students would, will do whatever um, you feel is necessary to make um, the budget process more into our favor the way that programs go, like ones that we want. Um, is there any questions? Councilor McLaughlin, are you asking, or are you putting forth the possibility of another fundraiser by students and or parents, such um, as it pr was proposed last spring? We are looking at something like that. We just want you to know that we're open um, to suggestions on what we could do to help you through this process. Okay, I want to let you know right now that I am not in favor of that kind of participation by parents and students in the budget process. And I think a lot of good comment was made about that last spring. I also want to remind you, and you know my interest in the school system, because I have two daughters in the school system. 
that maintenance is also very important. You've talked about that tonight. That's something I've always spoken in favor of because if we don't keep up with our maintenance and look at it long term, you're not going to have the buildings to have your programs in. Well, um, one of the other things that we are, are very um, really looking towards is the fact that you guys did spend a lot of money to improve our buildings, which we very much appreciated. It beats sitting beside the drippy roof in the bucket, mm. doesn't it? Yeah, and space to actually sit in. And so that's just what we'd like to say to you. Um, no, I, would, oh. I would just like to say that I'm in agreement with Councilman McLaughlin that I'm very much against uh, students and parents have to go out and on a fundraising to subsidize the budget. I think between the council and the school board should be able to put together a budget that is adequate to educate you and the other students without getting into fundraising. And I would Sorry if I caused any confusion by coming up earlier, but I just wanted to respond to the chairman of the school board's comments. <laughs> that's what happens when you. That me? That, that's what happens when you come back again. <laughs> Speak only once. <laughs> For those at home, the students are all leaving. The student observers from the civics course. Three minutes early. Three minutes early. I appreciate the opportunity. Uh, to have a, have a chance to give some input. My understanding of what this was entitled uh, to give us an opportunity was to, to give our feelings, or to give my feelings as a citizen here in town of what I'd like to see uh, the thought process or some of the thought process that goes into the school budget makeup this year. Uh, I think in, these day, in this day and age, uh, zero base budgeting, what does that really mean? To me it means having every department go back and start from scratch and build the budget. Not proceed based on where we are today with some assumption uh, and move forward, but go back to what it is that you need. Uh, to go into a, to a budgetary process where you, you, it, you wrap it up in the end of June and not know what your salary uh, element is going to be for your school budget, I, I don't understand uh, how you can proceed with that. Uh, I don't understand why it's so complicated to run a budget. I mean, the schools are run like businesses. Uh, they, they have overhead, they have maintenance of buildings, they have staff to pay, they have benefits, they have FICA or uh, contributions to teacher uh, retirement systems. I'm not understanding why it is so complicated that that, that process is such a, a big deal. Uh, businesses negotiate with unions. They seem to be able to get to the point where they can come up with budgets. Uh, I think these are very, very difficult times. Uh, I'm a very interested in what goes on in the school system myself. And ultimately, I'll pay whatever my, my tab is. I have a fair number of, uh, I've got a couple children in the program right now. But at the same time, I know that Cape Elizabeth is not immune to what's going on in this state, in this region, and there are a lot of people that are having difficult times in our, our, our uh, society here, and, and I think we run the risk of becoming even more elitist uh, in our reputation around the state if we don't uh, address that now and, and uh, try to get some consistency in our budgeting. It seems outrageous to me to, to have valuable employees in our town have to look at a 5% increase and have our town manager manage to that and have a school department that uh, is in a position where they maybe can look at a 10% increase. I think one of the things that should be required and requested is that budget departments, regardless of it, if it's town or if it's a school, they approach it based on, on uh, some outside assumptions. I'm, however, opposed to uh, the chairman of the finance committee coming back to the school board and saying, uh, we think 7 or 8% is nice work back into that number. I think we have to force all of our departments to go back to a zero-based approach and start from scratch. Uh, consistency, however, from department to department is very important to me. And I, I would say uh, that we should be able to get to where we need to get without uh, uh, deteriorating our programs uh, 
at the last minute and causing the kind of furor and anger and, and problem that we had when we at the last minute tried to eliminate a couple programs last year. Uh, I think this year I'd, I'd love to see a, a lot more opportunity for input from the public. I, I can't see where that can hurt as long as it's early on in the process. I don't see any problem with having uh, the children that are involved in our school system have opportunity for input. Um, I think these, are, these times call for uh, getting a little creative and uh, being more open in our communication and not less open. Somehow, it just doesn't surprise me that the chairman of the school board didn't know that he was supposed to be here tonight. Uh, and that's not a negative comment, it's just that maybe it's an example of how communication could certainly be improved upon. Any other public comment? My name is Richard Hall and I come from Shore Acres. I want to make a comment to Mr. Leslie. When he goes into negotiations with the parent of teachers, or I mean with the association, teachers association, I hope he remembers that a lot of neighbors of mine are out of a job now. A lot of people in Shore Acres, a lot of people in Cape Elizabeth are out of work now. They're not looking for a they weren't looking for a pay increase. They were just looking to hold their jobs. And I hope teachers, I know the career ladder was put in so we could bring in a better class of teacher, which it did. And I, I agreed with it at the time. But I'm a union man, have been all my life in my profession. And when we went into contracts, when times got tough, we held the line. And that's all we did. We didn't get an increase. We just hoped to hold what we had. And I hope when you start negotiating that you have that in the back of your mind. Thank you. Other comments, please. Seeing none, I will again refer back to the council. Are there any other comments within the context of the public hearing? I, I have just one comment. At what point, and I'll put this question to you, finance chairman, are we to let the school board know and employees of the town what we're thinking of as far as an increase this year? Are we going to wait until the budgets are together or are we going to tell them at this point that to come in with a budget with such and such an increase? Well, my intent three months ago <coughs> in November before uh, we ran into the problems with uh, the shortfall in the state budget and the proposal at best that state aid to education remains constant uh, you know over the next biennium before all of that happened before of the before the problems with the uh, Persian Gulf heated up um, you know, prior to your January 23rd meeting coming up uh, again I had hoped that we as a council could debate and perhaps come up with some kind of direction uh, with respect to a, a final figure, at least a maximum final figure, uh, and a maximum uh, percentage uh, increase, if any increase. I'm not, uh, I'm not sure we can do that. I think there have been a variety of things happen in the last 90 days where I am somewhat pessimistic that we can accomplish uh, what I had hoped to accomplish. However, uh, on the other hand, I think the two, two public hearings we have held have been uh, crucial from the point of view of making it crystal clear to everyone involved in the budget process uh, that these are very difficult times. Um, and you know, austerity and all sorts of uh, adjectives uh, and words describing uh, the financial climate that we're in, uh, I'm not sure are terribly helpful to go over a shopping list. Um, but I'll throw that out to the council. Uh, are there counselors who feel that we are in a position uh, to make some kind of specific uh, recommendation this evening uh, in a public forum? I would like um, for us to answer that question, those who wish to. 
um, after we close the public hearing mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and go on to discussion of the item. Sure. I was just responding to uh, Billy. Okay. If there is no one else, make a comment in the public hearing. We'll close the public hearing and move on to item 121 to consider public hearing comments on the outlook for the municipal and school budgets and take any necessary action. Councilor Reed? Uh, yes. Um, I would uh, be opposed at this point to putting uh, a percentage increase on the school board budget uh, until we find out what the state's share of aid to education will be because I feel that that's going to have to be absorbed in the budget. Um, I would like to ask Mr. Leslie, please, when you go into negotiations, to ask the teachers to consider a zero percent increase. Whether or not that becomes uh, what happens is another story, but that is my request. Other comments from counselors? Council Amaral. Well, all of the public comment that we've received so far in the two uh, meetings that we've had, I think the message is pretty clear from everybody that uh, we've got to try to hold the line as much as possible. Uh, I don't think we can wait to find out what the state's going to do with general purpose aid because it'll will be through our budget probably before we know that answer. I think we have to assume flat funding, which means for us probably about the same as we got last year. Uh, because the valuation has decreased compared to uh, the rest of the state. Um, so I think if we assume the same amount of money as uh, last year, and basically that's what, about what we've been getting from uh, general purpose aid anyway, if anything, maybe a little bit less each year. Uh, I think that we, that we should be pretty clear that if there is any increase this year, it's going to be really small. Uh, and I don't know if we want to set a figure. We said to the town 5% at the most for the municipal side. I, I would suggest that we do the same thing with the school budget and say that uh, we would request that you try to hold the line, uh, but anything up to 5% is something that we would consider. Councilor Jordan. I've been, I'm in agreement with what Councilor Amroy to say that uh, the overall increase this year, as far as I'm concerned, is, is anywhere from 0 to 5%, and I'll fight hard if it was over 5%. Anybody's budget, overall. Well, as I explained to Mr. Leslie, that we um, asked Michael to come up with his dream budget at a possible 5% increase, but that was no guarantee that it would stay at that amount. So it was a I bad dream. <laughs> 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 Not quite a nightmare, but I, I sort of want to um, reinforce what Jane said and, and consider the school department to only look at that much of an increase. And <coughs> I'd like to clarify, I'm talking about an increase in the tax rate, tax rate percent, overall. which may not mean a any increase at all in anybody's budget. It might mean a decrease. In fact, it probably will mean a decrease. So we're talking about a percentage of increase on the tax not an increase in the budgets. I guess uh, yeah, I really want to make that quite clear. That's, that's the way I understand it. Right. That was my point. Tax on the tax increase as far as. Council McLaughlin. I spoke previously and used the word painful. I think that's still going to be a very relevant term during this budget process. I think Council Amro has spelled it out quite nicely. And I appreciate her comment in treating the school side at the same level that we treat the town side. I think there tends to be some talk at budget time of our one town concept and at that time you don't hear but you know the word hypocritical is floating around out there. I hope we can put an end to some of that this year as we go through the budget process. Well, I think the whole intent <coughs> of having these uh, hearings was to underscore the issue of parity. Um, we know that uh, Cumberland County is increasing about $11,000 to Cape Elizabeth. Uh, we know community services pretty much pays for their, uh, their own program. So, you know, the rest of the budget is the school and the municipal side. Uh, and I think uh, for an overall maximum um, increase 
of, of 5 percent would at least be some kind of ceiling that uh, we could be working within. Uh, you know, certainly Jane has kept her uh, finger on the pulse of the, um, the Board of Education in her position as uh, chairman. Uh, if uh, you feel confident that, that state aid can remain relatively uh, constant, you know, over the next year, um, I think that it would not be unreasonable to propose at least a, a maximum amount, which doesn't mean we have to go to that maximum either, but at least as a ceiling, um, that would be a, a comfortable number from my perspective. I'd, I'd add that from the state point of view, the flat funding is, the, I think, the minimum. If anything, we, would, we could expect some increase from that. Any other further comments from counselors? If not, this really is not an item that we actually have to vote on. It's more of public comment <coughs> and discussion. So I'll go on to our next public hearing, um, dealing with a statement of the Fort, William, Fort Williams uses, Fort Williams Park uses. Um, these were presented to us last month by Chairman um, Clint Flood. Do you want to quickly go over them or... Um, refresh anyone's mind, or does anyone have any comments to make on this? Clint? Thank you, Chairman uh, Cloggesville. Um, as I said last time, the statement of public use, or statement of uses of Fort Williams Park, uh, we basically have put it into a form that we feel that uh, will work, and it really has been working in the past. A couple of major changes have been that on groups that are under 150 people uh, can contact the town manager directly. And the town manager makes a decision whether or not uh, they can use the park. There are four categories uh, which limit this 150-person uh, usage. First off, any groups over 150 people have to come before the Fort Williams Commission, which then re receive approval or rejection, and, that, and those approval or rejections then come before the town council. The second would be any uh, group that wants exclusive use of an area other than the picnic shelter. Uh, so if a group came before, came to uh, the town manager and wanted to have use of a particular area, and they might number 25 people, they still would have to come before the uh, commission, the Fort Williams Commission. <coughs> any groups uh, under 150 people requesting a weekend activity between, this is where we made the change last time, between Memorial Day weekend uh, and Labor Day uh, would require uh, coming before the, the uh, commission again. Any group that would advertise their event in, uh, to the general public, we would want them to come before the commission. Uh, the second area was we categorized the, uh, in four categories, the use of the park in terms of priority. For example, our last meeting that we had on Monday, we had members, uh, groups from all four categories come to our meeting. The first category would have priority would be the town of Cape Elizabeth or Cape Elizabeth school events. Second category would be events and activities of Cape Elizabeth organizations. This would be like Little League. Three, the traditional events that have been held at Fort Williams Park, such as the Portland Symphony, and four, other special activities and events would be the, the last category in terms of priority. The, uh, we also are, are looking in terms of the number of people. We don't want the fort to become overcrowded for, from one particular group, and that's dealt with in the uh, top pages of the top of the second page. The last area that uh, uh, perhaps has uh, some direct input, and that has been on the fee use of groups not a fee for general admittance into the park, but fee for group usage. And we had changed the A and B categories from $1 per vehicle to $2 per vehicle, or on people intensive groups would go from 25 cents to a dollar. Those are the primary changes. Thank you. Is there anyone from the public who wishes to make a comment? There being none, I'll close the public hearing. And we'll move on to item 122 to consider adoption of the proposed statement of Fort Williams Park uses and take any necessary action. Councilors? 
That's McLaughlin. Clint, I have a question for you on what you read this evening. In the first grouping of four, you have groups under 150 persons requesting weekend activity between Memorial Day. You said between Memorial Day and Labor Day. What I have in front of me says between Memorial Day weekend and October 1st. It should be Memorial Day to Labor Day. Labor Day weekend or Labor, Labor Day? Day. The, the reason for that is the primary intensive time on weekends and the concept of the commission is that, that should be open time. The fort should be open for all groups to be able to, or people just to come in and use it on a first come first serve basis. No, that's fine. I think it makes a lot of sense. I just want to make sure we get the right wording in whatever we are going to act on this evening. Madam Chairman, I would move <coughs> that we, what are we doing, adopt the proposed statement of uses for Fort Williams Park as presented to us with the revision in number three that it goes until Labor Day. Second. Second. Okay, I would like to ask the town manager for a comment on the changing from October 1st to uh, Labor Day. Do you? Yeah. Is there a reason for October 1st being presented the first time? Yeah. M my recollection is, is uh, the original concern of the committee was the extent of use during the month of September. Uh, actually, at that point, you're, you're past the primary beach season, and a lot more people tend to go to a place like Fort Williams instead of going to the beach. Uh, so September, particularly May and September, weekends tend to be extremely busy and active uh, at Fort Williams Park. Uh, the end of September, we're, we're particularly we're at that point, we're into the full leaf season. So was that October 1st date a um, result of decision by the Fort Williams Committee or recommendation or? I don't remember at this point. Councilor Jordan. I, I agree with the manager. I think it should be October 1st because I think September is a it must nowadays think so that there's a lot of nice weather and I think that we should use the October day. And so on these vehicle uses and charges, if a group of uh, over 150 of the vehicle, you charge them two blocks, then you charge them more for the personnel that has to be there, like public works, police, and they pay this charge plus the town's out-of-pocket expenses. Out-of-pocket expenses. <coughs> okay, and uh, the same way with uh, both charges, is what you're saying? That's correct. Now, how do you figure the, is a bus load a group, in your opinion? Yes. So if they come in to look at the headlight and make a visit, Somebody going to be down there and get a buck off them? There's a couple of three buses. No, because they haven't made a special reserved use of the park. They're quick in and out. I, I don't think this policy, uh, you know, addresses, you know, that. It's, I think there's very few buses with more than 150 people. Uh, well, if you have enough buses, you can get 150 people. I don't want you to charge them. That ain't my idea. There's no intent. But I don't want somebody to get the idea they can do it when five buses come in there with 50, 60 people on if it wasn't clear, every policy should have an exception. That is correct. You and I wrote <laughs> policies the other day. I want to make it 100% clear that uh, we don't charge one and not the other. And uh, I get upset on the deals there. It's like when the Army was there on that special day here a while ago, did we charge them for the rescue unit? They made a donation to the rescue unit. We did not charge them. We had a policy that it was going to be X number of dollars, period. And uh, <coughs> if we make policies, I like to stick to the policies. Because I was against that policy because they was after one group and not everybody. And therefore, there have been exceptions afterwards. And I'm against those things. It's either for everyone or no one. Okay, well, we can have we that can exception in that policy. Maybe we've got to get back to it again. We can discuss the policy issue, perhaps another forum, other than what is right before us now. We have a motion. Well, I feel I have to get my background in here. Okay. Speak. <laughs> okay, once you hit the floor. Uh, Councilor McLaughlin, um, 
would you want to uh, change your motion or can we talk to my second I'd be happy to go <laughs> to October 1st uh, madam chairman I would amend the initial motion to have groups between 150 persons requesting a weekend activity between Memorial Day weekend and October 1st Second. thank you mr. Jordan any further discussion all those in favor the 7 zero vote Item 123, to consider a request for, from the Cape Elizabeth School Department to utilize school bond funds for the repair of a section of the roof at the middle school and take any necessary action. We have a letter here from Superintendent of Schools, Connie Goldman. Would you want to come up and just go over this a bit with us and for the benefit of the public as well? Right. In essence, what we've had to uh, continue um, all fall is rechecking roof projects for structural integrity. I think you are aware from previous conversations uh, uh, with the school committee that um, beginning with the fall, a structural engineering company was hired. And uh, frankly, when I started this job and having had some background with roof issues and realizing that there had been some uh, re-roofing done that had inserted insulation into roofs um, I felt it was expedient for us to ask the structural engineers to continue checking all of those uh, pieces um, what popped out of that uh, and is the subject of this memo is that the uh, trust roof on the connector so-called connector link portion uh, between the uh, original brick building uh, in the middle school and the uh, locker room <coughs> area that's officially known as a connector link area uh, trust roof was put over there a year or so ago and although it did not present the same kinds of problems that the trust roof uh, was presenting that was taken down over the um, D section of the middle school building uh, we were advised that we should beef up the structure uh, taking into consideration snow loads uh, again, once uh, I, I, I apologize if I'm repeating myself because I go into these roof explanations and frankly I feel like I was um, running a tape. But once you put insulation into roofs that were engineered for um, the situation in which is typical of the 60s, 70s sort of egg crate schools, uh, when oil was about nine cents a gallon and they were deliberately constructed so that heat would go up through the flat roof, melt a good deal of the snow go down through the drains and so forth uh, when we got into energy conservation situations and we're now required in public buildings to try to get to R30 uh, as far as insulation factor you interrupt that melt situation and you introduce a structural issue that then has to be checked because the building wasn't engineered to hold the uh, literally tons of weight that can accumulate in a bad winter especially if you get heavy snow wet snow frozen and doesn't melt readily and so forth so for this reason for I think in 77 there was a very heavy snow year some public building um, including school buildings had trouble with those roofs and the codes uh, gradually became increased uh, for that reason we are now checking all of anyway the good news is most of these situation projects are fine um, however we have had to uh, add structural reinforcement to the connector link truss roof um, I do make a note in this memo that we also have one uh, section of the high school roof which we are now under snow removal program if we accumulate more than a foot of snow and the three portable structures have to be checked for any accumulation of snow we will probably have to do some extra work on them next summer so that we can avoid that um, situation uh, anyway, uh, my, that's part of my explanation. My reason for being here tonight is to ask you to extend authorization to use the, uh, re uh, the remainder of the monies you authorized for the various roof projects in the bonds. And we have included a sheet that summarizes um, where the expenditures are uh, with a uh, projected um, uh, actual balance of 84478 I've given you a rundown in very general terms, but these are uh, essentially, I mean, I, each of these subcategories could be broken down further, but trying to give you the general uh, bottom line of 80000 for this project. I should point out it's not only the connector link roof we're dealing with, we're also dealing with the so-called boiler room end, 
that too needed some work. We had a small asbestos removal project. We ran into some extra problems with that during the construction that uh, caused that price to be higher than we had originally anticipated. Our general contractor's fees were higher than general uh, originally anticipated also because we felt it was expedient to ask the contractors to work overtime um, and during holiday session so that we did not have, have to interrupt classes. I'm really very happy to tell you that the uh, Denalco uh, contractor who was in charge of the project uh, really did a fine job. We got in there. We did not have to interrupt any classroom time and so forth. So it is a finished deal. Um, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Councilor McLaughlin. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Ms. Goldman, I don't know if when the school board hired you as interim superintendent, they had as one of their criteria a knowledge of roofs, but <laughs> I commend I them so. for hiring somebody <laughs> with that knowledge. I'm very impressed with your understanding, your ability to present the information. I know it's not something that everybody possesses. I'm glad you do. I do have a question. When would this proposed roof work and is it more asbestos removal in the boiler room area or what is it? That we've already completed that piece. That piece, okay. the, I, I just wanted to point out that the 56,990 uh, figure includes that. also includes some change orders, one of which uh, is dealing with a problem uh, with the uh, section of the roof, uh, actually the boiler room roof where there's splashing and some, um, some raw edges uh, left over from uh, the original contractor's work, we tried to get him to come back, uh, or the people in charge of trying to get him to come back during the fall and, and fix it. It uh, did not seem to be something that was going to be taken care of. And uh, frankly, after discussing it with the pertinent people, we decided to go ahead and have this contractor do it. I think I make note under Section 4 up there that we have checked with our attorneys on the advisability of doing that. It was important for us to get it done as quickly as possible. When would you anticipate doing the work that you're asking us to authorize? It is, the, this, uh, this the problem is the work has already been this done. This has been done. Uh, we are coming to you okay. after the fact. I mean, obviously, Go I off. have to admit that <laughs> I may know something about roast, but in this case, my timing is bad. Uh, okay. I sort of took it for granted I'll that catch we, on, right. <laughs> we were under a, uh, a bond issue on roofs and that this was not... Uh, you know, that this was somehow just part of it. I really didn't ask that question uh, as soon as I should have. I, I think, apologize. I know. I'm, they've straightened me out. <laughs> yes. Ms. Goldman, the, uh, the, the lion's share of the, uh, the $94,000 uh, unencumbered surplus for the 9091 bond issue stems from the categories entitled Other Roofs and the Middle School Roof Section DW. Uh, did we just come under that budgetary uh, uh, intent by about $100,000 due to luck, or where do we pick up that hundred grand? Uh, help me out now. You're looking at the 9091 bond issue? Bond issue on the, the, the first two categories, uh, middle school roof and then other roofs, where it right. looks like the, <coughs> the, the major bulk of the surplus exists. Right. I, since I was not really part of the planning process of that figure, I can't give you that information. All I know is that um, there are uh, some pieces, uh, there's a small piece in there that is frankly under settlement com money that would have been paid out at this point, except that we're in uh, settlement conversations with the, one of the contractors. Uh, but I think that the point of your question, frankly, is that some roofs must have come in under the original estimate. So after this $80,000 would be paid to the appropriate people who have done the work, with both of the bond issues, we would have essentially a surplus of about $4,000? Uh, presumably, although frankly we have, there's another small change order coming up that I will need to cover, and I would like permission to use to all of this bond money for that um, purpose. I think I, I will need that extra 4000 so you're, you're asking us this evening then to authorize the 84478? That's correct. Uh, <coughs> yes, Superintendent Goldman, uh, I'm looking at the asbestos removal, mm -hmm. and since I wasn't on the town council and you weren't superintendent when this was all done, we can both 
complete ignorance. But uh, could you tell me how that came in $35,800 uh, off, over budgeted? Well, what I, I believe this asbestos removal was used, uh, um, came into the budget because of the uh, leaks that occurred last summer that uh, created uh, some damage in the middle school and unfortunately some of the material that was damaged contained asbestos. Now this creates a couple of interesting problems. One of them is that the insurance coverage either through the municipal, our own municipal coverage or possibly uh, through litigation for the contractor who is judged to be, um, if judged to be at fault in this case, they will reimburse us for uh, non-asbestos carrying uh, materials replacement. They will not, re at this point, they're telling us we cannot get reimbursement either from either carrier for the extra expenses incurred in removing uh, those materials that, that contain asbestos. As you may or may not be aware, um, since the HERA uh, update of, I guess it's now about three years ago, uh, any material like vinyl asbestos tile, and the schools are full of it, um, cannot simply be removed. And if there's mastic containing asbestos um, underneath that, and in this case, uh, what I understand happened, the vinyl tile started, you know, was the water damage caused it to curl up and either there was mastic underneath that contained the asbestos, I'm not sure if you know, Peter, it's either the tile or the mastic or both. Um, which becomes very rapidly when you're removing uh, asbestos carrying materials a very expensive uh, item. Um, there was some hope that some of this 86,000 would be reimbursable. There'll be some pieces, uh, as they say, the non asbestos bearing materials we will get some reimbursement from, but most of that 86 is probably not reimbursable through the insurance, nor is it reimbursable through any state aid program. We are having some asbestos materials removed under the uh, state bonds on. Uh, what they call priorities one and two. Uh, they keep, I, I think I explained that at one or two board meetings ago, they come in and do small projects and so on. Um, that's a long explanation I'd be happy to go into a, a little later if you wish. Well, just um, my next question was bottom line. Uh, is there any state reimbursement for the asbestos removal or the restructuring since this is more than just a repair, maintenance, uh, the oh, that might be helpful. Okay. The this particular item of asbestos removal, I understand from what I my current uh, inquiries, will not be reimbursable under the state. However, we and as a matter of fact, in our board meeting tomorrow, we have a piece of information uh, that the latest bond issue does po carry the possibility, at least, of getting some reimbursement for the very structural reinforcement project that I'm here tonight to talk about. Those kinds of things that are required by changes in code when one is re-roofing. Um, you don't get reimbursement for the roofing. Uh, there usually is no reimbursement for the extra costs of removing asbestos carrying materials in roofs. But uh, I, I believe, although we have not yet gone through the process and I don't know what will happen, but we'll certainly file it, that the latest state bond holds out the hope of re, uh, reimbursement for the structural pieces that we just did. And should we have to do others? Perhaps we'll also be able to get something from that. And when that money comes in, if it does, how will that be accounted for within the school budget? Well, when that kind of money comes back in, it obviously has to be credited as a revenue. Um, and I would have to discuss with the town manager how we tag it and where it goes and so on. I mean, naturally, I would hang on to it for dear life. But <laughs> I recognize that it has to be. Um, you know, there's a process we have to follow, and that would, whatever that would be. Other questions? Councilor Jordan. Uh, Council Reed took one of my questions where the money was going, when, if and when any come back, and I was wondering if we could get it back if we could get these funds tonight. Any that comes back. I don't want Peter to get it. Madam Chairman, do you want this vote in two different figures, the 80000 and the 4000 or do you want it all done in one? We probably should do it in two, but I have a couple of questions I want to ask myself, if no one else has questions. Um, when we uh, approved the amount <coughs> for the bond issue um, last spring, 
we had there were certain projects that were going to be done and that was supposed to be enough money to complete these projects what projects are not going to be done if we allow you to spend this money for this basic repair oh well I'm sorry I don't have as complete a I have seen some lists that were originally um, uh, I believe part of that original presentation some of which however were not com were, were crossed off the list so I'm not sure what ones you have in mind and what ones because uh, the original request for the bonding was higher than this in other words the, the second bond is a smaller sum than the school department originally brought but I don't know exactly where this timeline is as far as I can see the these sums were pretty much what you see there with the exception that the roof uh, as you pointed out the bids came in lower than apparently they had estimated yeah. all of the projects that were agreed to be funded by the town council in late May are, will be completed under the bond the savings comes about because of savings in some of those particular areas and particularly in, in the roof area so uh, so were they basically overestimated the amount that it would cost my my assumption is is that uh, the estimates uh, the essentially yes. I was trying to avoid this, that terminology, but essentially yes. Oh, it's just that bonding money is very expensive money, and roof repairs basically should come under your basic operational budget. But they've been neglected for so many years, we had no choice but to bond them. And I just didn't want to think that perhaps that um, antis that anticipated expense for these repairs was padded that was hopefully that wasn't happening now when I saw an $84,000 um, so I obviously there. can't address it no <coughs> but um, we can I, take yes? if I may I think uh, on the bids for all the flat roofs that were done there was a very wide variance in the bids that were received uh, which I think did show that you know that potential savings came about because of the bid process. I think in, in all of the discussion about all the, the roofs this fall, it never came out the fact that the, the flat roofs were in fact bid out and uh, did come in quite a bit less than estimated. All of the discussion was on the, the raised roof at the middle school, all of the public attention. Madam Chairman, I also think we need to stay aware that with the economic climate and the contractors looking for work in the past year none of that or not all of that was well known perhaps at the time the budget was <coughs> being deliberated and some of the prices that had come up that we eventually got for work to be done were less than a lot of people may have anticipated mm -hmm. Connie, <coughs> you had made the point uh, on page two of your summary that uh, some of the costs um, that you're asking for this evening would have been part of the original bond uh, had a structural engineering firm been retained and, and basically avoided some of the problems we, we ran into. Is there any estimate uh, as to what that fee would have been? Well, all the, uh, you know, the base work that the engineers are doing in the sense of analyzing the structures and running the numbers and so forth, uh, we would have had to pay for. I mean, that would have been an engineering uh, service. Um, this, uh, the drawing, the, the schematic drawing and so on that they've done and whatever those fees are, and the, I would say, in all likelihood, the structural work that's been done itself would have been recommended. The thing is, if you hire the structural company in advance of getting into this, they will often give you options. As I note at the end here, I still am not sure what we're going to do with the uh, Section D, where the roof has come off. I mean, to some degree, it's not, it has been patched, it isn't leaking. Um, and in meeting with the space uh, school space committee, your council committee, um, you will be hearing from that group, I believe, uh, shortly. And one of the issues that we will be discussing at that time is how to study the needs of the building uh, from a variety of renovation points of view. Um, it's the thing about getting the structural engineering f firm first is that you get some options, make some choices. What we were now doing is inserting ourselves after a choice had been made, which limited the options they could give us. But 
much of it, I think, in one way or the other, you would have incurred. Superintendent Goldman, would you prefer that we just authorize you to um, be able to spend the whole 84478 whatever you need to complete the project? Yes, I will. You're anticipating another $4,000 or so? Yes, you know, I have a change order I know coming up that has to do with some, some um, um, bracing work that needs to be completed, and I would appreciate that authorization. So we could have a motion um, approving spending up to So moved. Second. Any further discussion? All those in favor? To seven zero. Thank you very much. <coughs> Item number one twenty four to consider acknowledging receipt of the report of the municipal facilities committee and take any necessary action. Mr. Irv Chapel, who is chairman of this committee, Already. who has <laughs> produced two fantastic pieces. First, I want to say hi to everybody tonight. The last time I was here was when we brought the report of the highway uh, needed improvements and so forth. We're glad to see that that is progressing very nicely. Mike brought the plans down at our last meeting, and we were certainly happy to be a part of the start of that. We've tried to do the same thing with uh, police and fire. Now, I haven't got any notes, and I'm probably going to forget a lot of things, so it's going to be darn short. The, uh, I thought that I'd just give you an idea how we arrived at this beautiful report that you have in your packets. I'm sure you've all read it, gone through all the square footages and all of the other things, so we don't even need to bother with those tonight. The charge that we had given to us, which is listed here, we tried to follow all the way through. We tried to stay away from the idea of hallways, where the bathrooms go, girls and boys lockers and all those things, and just stay with the big picture, how many square feet are needed, where it will fit, do our cubes. I was lucky enough to have all kinds of architects and engineers and former fire chiefs and lieutenants and when it gets to the question period I got them right here <laughs> so you don't have to worry there the uh, we brought the fire department and the police department together and the entire committee with them and the town manager visit the buildings then we started out what do we need to know and you see some of those reports in the first part of your book which I think are going to be invaluable as you go along to anybody that takes over from us, the architect, if you d when you decide to go ahead. And it gives him the basis of all of these things that we finally have in our summary. We asked each one of the chiefs to give us their idea of what they had for shortcomings at the present time. Then their idea of what they would need in 5, 10, or 20 years from now. Then. Well, when we got all that information together, which you have in here, we sat down again with them and said, okay, what have you got for square footage that you're operating in now? Where is that deficient, and how many square feet would you need to have the kind of a facility that you would like to have? When we got that information all together, you know how chiefs are. You, uh, they, they ask for the moon, hoping they'll get a couple of stars, so we had to look that all over and go back and have them cut that down to what is good and workable. No frills, just good and workable. And with that, we then decided, now we've got something, what can we do with it? Well, you gave us a charge of can we fit what the town of Cape Elizabeth needs in the next 5, 10, or 20 years into the present location. That was our main job. After we got this all together, we found out, yes, it will. We gave you three options, because you're the fellows and girls that are going to say yes or no on these things. So we got one option was to put a second story on the present fire station and renovate and add to the police department out back, not change too much the physical look of the thing except the second floor and another bay towards the 
uh, Farm Cove IGA on that side. And uh, we looked at that, and it'll work. We also have a letter in here that you'll find in here from the fellow that looked at the building to see what would be needed to put a second floor on it. Then we looked at taking the front building and turning that into the police department. We liked that a little bit, those that talked about it, because we could get away from that big apron out front and landscape this thing and have it go along possibly a little better for the center of town. That was one of the pluses that we liked very much. You'd only keep the one story out front and you'd go back to the middle and that would be jointly used between fire and police as it is now, only it would have to be renovated and cut different than it is now and then put a new building onto that out back for the five bays for the fire department. That one works too. We got to those two and we were going to have this great big meeting, all my professionals and myself, to decide which one to bring to you. Well, we looked at the charge again. We can't do that. We need architects. We need structural people. We need engineers. We need soil tests. We need this, we need that. You know, in other words, when you decide to do it, then you hire this fellow, and he does those things for you, all in his contract. So we said, okay, we'll take this, and we'll present it to the council as our final report, recommending to you that you do this, that you get this engineer, that you get these architects, that you get the rest that are needed, and then they will come back to you of which is the more feasible for you to use, option A or option B. With that... I'm all done. Now, if you vote seven to nothing to accept that, I can go sit down. <laughs> Mr. Chapel, would you like to um, read off the names of your committee members? Oh, I'd love to. And uh, not only that, but that gives me a chance. Thank you very much for that. Uh, what a committee. That, uh, that uh, uh, appointments group, is it, of yours? Mm -hmm. Oh, they're to be commended. Send them a, send them a, send them a <laughs> vote of thanks. That fellow up top there was the chairman. That's me. Okay. I had Joe Feely, and what a guy. He isn't here tonight, but he's, uh, I can talk to say anything I want about him, can't I? <laughs> he, uh, he's a good architect. He brought in the OSHA stuff, the ramps, the uh, separate toilets, how many cabinets you need for so many men for hanging clothes, and all that stuff, which was wonderful, and we needed it. We went down to Gilly Jordan. I don't know what he did, but boy, <laughs> I'm telling you, he, he can bring out more things. He's putting it as bad as that other Jordan. And for you to think about, you know, by golly, it's something. Bill, I like you underneath that American flag. <laughs> we had Paul Liberty. He's a contractor. Couldn't have put a better man on. He went over there to the Public Works Department, looked at those corners, saw those cracks and so forth, and what happened when your architect and those people went over? That was your answer. In other words, the groundwork was done. I like that. We had Mike Maroon. He's not here tonight, but Mike brought in everything you can think of. Being with the IRS so long, boy, it takes a lot to fool him, I'm telling you. <laughs> I'm not sure some of it was too good, but he was good. <laughs> Chuck Wilson, fire chief, instigator, and everything else you can think of, but a great help when you're talking about fire department, what they need. Poor chief didn't have a chance. We had one chief sitting here and a prior chief sitting here, and away we went. When it got too wild, I adjourned the, me adjourned the meeting. <laughs> and we had Tom Emery. And you know, when you get to these things, you always get to the person at the last that you're so doggone proud of. I don't care what the others say, that I spent too much time on Tom Emery, because he deserves it. Take a look in your packet there. You're right there? Yes. Take a look at those two drawings yeah. in the back end. There is something that you've got now to turn over professional job to your architect, your engineers, and take over. Parking spaces are numbered, how many cars we can get in, how big the apron is for the fire department, the whole blessed thing is there, and that is all due to my good friend, Tom Emery. Yeah. <laughs> Will you vote now? <laughs> <laughs> Any questions, seriously? Questions? Councilor McLaughlin. You've got to speak up, you know. I'm getting along years, and I don't hear too well. Stephanie, you have those birthdays. I, last time you looked at me, I said, you said, how long will it take you to get this uh, fire department and police department report together? I thought for a minute, I said, about two years. And the look on your face, I said, we better get it done this year because <laughs> she's not happy. Go ahead. Irv, explain to me what a sally port is. Yeah. 
Tell him what a sally port is, will you? Basically, that's You've got to go to the microphone. So everybody, so everybody else will be as educated as I am. Basically, what that is for the police department, when they're, uh, if they have apprehended someone, uh, they can take the vehicle into the garage uh, and be able to bring the people into the building without having to deal with those problems outside. So you drive them in rather than walk them in? Yes. Is that what it amounts to? I, that's my understanding. That, 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 everybody agree with that? that? That's the way I understand it. <laughs> that, that, that is correct because I come across that in putting together the new jail committees. They're all Sally Ports around. Now, while I've got, may I, Mr. Chen, while I've got you all here, and I figured, figured Irv, look, a one meeting, you know, with you people is, is wonderful and I enjoy it, but I, not too often. Uh, the <laughs> Municipal Facilities Committee, at the same time, you charged us with a building at 1226 Shore Road. Now, we know that we can't discuss that tonight, and we know you can't vote on it, and we know you can't do anything, and we know you'll probably want us back for some questions, but we want to show you how darned efficient we were, and that report is also in your packet. There's your report on 1226 Shore Road. Read it when you get home. Maybe not tonight. You may be too tired, but tomorrow night. Any other questions? You can receive that tonight with thanks, too, if you want to. I, I just want to say to her, uh, her that uh, I think you've done a tremendous job. And I know that uh, when you were recommended to chair this committee that uh, you would keep the ball rolling because it's the nature of the chapel. Because he gets pretty excited some of hockey games and I have to look across the way there and keep my eye on him because I pray he might have a heart attack. <laughs> but I like to report, I think it's tremendous. And I think you will realize that I hope we don't collect too much dust due to the economic conditions at this time, but uh, I will want to move that we accept the report on the facilities committee with great gratitude. Thanks, second. And for the discussion, House of oh, excuse me, Mr. McGovern. Yeah, I, I would like to, uh, again, uh, emphasize, I think Herb did quite a bit but uh, just how terrific this committee was. Uh, I, I didn't attend every one of their meetings, but certainly a great number of them. And uh, you know, it, it definitely was probably about the best committee that I've worked with uh, in the 12 years that I've been in Cape Elizabeth. And Irv's leadership was tremendous, and I think the, the very talents on the committee uh, which were just really good to work with. And uh, would like to personally commend the committee for their work and also uh, the members of our staff who uh, worked with the committees, uh, with the committee, Don Webster, the fire chief, who provided uh, a lot of the input on the, uh, the fire department end of it, uh, Chief Pickering for the police department, for the police, and particularly uh, now Captain uh, Ed Tolan of uh, the police department, who provided a lot of the initial background information uh, to the committee dealing with some of the police department needs. And, uh, uh, they worked very well with the committee and uh, appreciate the committee's uh, interest in, in working with uh, those uh, staff members. And I just think it all worked well together. And thanks, sir. Councillor Amaro. I just want to make one brief comment, too. Question, have you? No questions. Uh, but I hear from people around the greater Portland area often uh, people saying, How come in Cape Elizabeth your tax rate is? no higher than ours. It, if anything, it might be lower. And you people are able to get so much accomplished in, in Cape Elizabeth. And I really think it's, this is a perfect example of the type of community spirit and community service that so many people have in town that we are able to do a heck of a lot uh, because people like you are willing to give your time so freely. Thanks so much. We appreciate it. Thank you very much. And I'll move the, the motion. All those in favor? Accepted. Seven zero. Thank you very much. We will probably have a workshop on this item, and we will notify you in advance if you want to be present. Madam Chairman, <laughs> if I may comment to the chapel. As I stood up there to salute the flag, the uh, first thing I thought of that most everybody was looking at my back, so I'm glad that you pointed that out. And next time I'll nod you over closer to Janet, and you'll be able to see the flag. <laughs>
Thanks, sir. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, should we have a five minute break? So moved. Where you want to look at it in 1968 or in 1985. I was discussing with Maureen O'Meara, the town planner today, as to when we first saw a, a proposed subdivision for Broad Cove. And those of you that have been around a while recognize that uh, this particular section first came in in the late 60s. And l plans very close to what we see now began to come in again in 1985 and again in 1987. I think probably this. <coughs> This particular plan uh, became to be started to be active uh, around the end of 1989. Uh, like any plan that, that goes through many years of uh, review, uh, there tend to be a lot of compromises made, and uh, a lot of issues come up as, as attitudes change uh, throughout the community and as, as ordinances change as well. Uh, the particular subdivision proposed you have here before you. Uh, did receive uh, preliminary approval uh, by the Cape Elizabeth Planning Board, I believe around the late summer, early fall of uh, 1990. Uh, subsequent to that, the, uh, the hopeful developer uh, submitted uh, the plan to the Maine Department of Environmental Protection. Uh, the, the DEP staff had a number of issues uh, that they reviewed with the developer as well as with town staff uh, over the last several months. Uh, as uh, you can see in your packet, the DEP did uh, eventually issue an order on this particular project, and uh, I, I won't review all of it because you do have it before you. Uh, one of the major issues uh, that uh, came out of the DE process and that has been discussed uh, probably through the last 20 years as this uh, project and development in this area has evolved is the issue of access and egress uh, to and in and out of Broad Cove. Uh, the present uh, plan before you is one that uh, is acceptable to the Maine Department of Environmental Protection. Uh, we had been hopeful at, at one point that we would be able to get a complete full access road uh, out of the Broad Cove subdivision. Uh, there's been a concern uh, with access, you know, as you're well aware, for, for some time. Uh, the DEP was extremely concerned, if you look at this plan up here, with uh, wetland impacts uh, along uh, what, what would be known as Farm Pond Road. Uh, that is the area that extends from Two Lights Road into uh, the intersection of Winding Way and Running Tide Road. Uh, after much pleading uh, with the DEP uh, by town staff and uh, by, uh, with the participation separately of the developer, uh, the DEP uh, did agree to permit a gravel uh, emergency access road that would be gated. Uh, there was, at one point, they wanted to have it 12 feet wide, and after uh, much debate, uh, the DEP was willing to increase it to 18 feet wide. Uh, that was on the basis of the fire lane ordinance uh, that's in the fire prevention code of the town. Uh, that's where they came up with the 18 feet. Uh, as things now stand, uh, the town staff, uh, the planner, the uh, public safety department heads, the public works director, and myself, I uh, think it's an okay plan. Uh, we, we have, I'm not about to give it a ringing, ringing endorsement because, uh, you know, if we had our druthers, uh, we'd have a full access road out of Broad Cove. Uh, you know, unfortunately, we do have to recognize there are a lot of other <coughs> players uh, who are involved in this process. Uh, first and foremost, the planning board, and, and secondly, the DEP. Our, our specific recommendation uh, uh, has essentially three different parts, uh, we as the staff. Uh, the first is that it is our preference that one last attempt be made to persuade the Maine Department of Environmental Protection to allow us to pave the access road. Uh, 
that you know we would hope that the council may be willing to go along with uh, if you know after the council requesting at the DEP wasn't willing to go along with it uh, the staff you know would very regrettably come back and go along with a gravel road uh, I think it's our feeling that uh, an emergency gravel road is better than uh, no road at all which is which is the present situation uh, again we're not exactly thrilled with this but it uh, is something that uh, you know as a result of a whole lot of compromises is the best <coughs> we feel we can do uh, secondly uh, the staff would recommend that during the term of construction during the time of construction that access uh, be from the two lights road area uh, two lights road section in, in farm pond road rather than bringing all of the traffic all the way through Broad Cove. Uh, the, the residents of Broad Cove have been extremely patient with all the building construction there over the years with the sewer construction in the, the late to, in the mid to late 1980s as well as uh, with the drainage project that went on there. So in order to, to not continually have traffic on all, all those roads and go all the way through the residential neighborhood, uh, we would suggest as, as a condition of uh, approval that uh, the construction traffic uh, go in from Two Lights Road. Uh, third, uh, it's the staff's recommendation that uh, as a condition of agreeing to accept these improvements that uh, phase one, which is the, the lower half of the project, uh, be constructed first. And that at the beginning of the project that a, uh, a bond or a letter of credit uh, be provided for phase one to ensure, in fact, that uh, the emergency road in its ultimate uh, development scheme uh, will in fact be constructed. Uh, beyond those specific comments, uh, I would like to point out that really what's before you as the council is to, is that you're agreeing to accept the public improvements uh, that will be part of the project as well as, as well as indicating that you're willing to accept the dedications of the various easements involved. Uh, if, if you are willing to do that, subsequently this plan would go back to the planning board. They would uh, give it final review and uh, then the developer uh, upon uh, filing the plan and receiving the necessary financing would begin the project and then ultimately when the improvements were, were constructed, they would return to the town uh, for final approval and all the deeds would be reviewed by the, t by the town attorney and everything in place. Uh, looking over there on the plan, you, you, you will note uh, two very large areas uh, that are greenish in color. Uh, those are areas that are proposed for dedication, I believe, currently to the Cape Elizabeth Land Trust. Uh, although, you know, to my, my understanding is that no final agreement has been reached with the Land Trust uh, for those properties. However, those areas were identified as a result of the planning process with the land trust and with the conservation commission. Uh, you know, if the council or the town itself was interested in uh, acquiring the